Hi everyone, welcome to Marketing 3340, rather, uh, Strategic Marketing Management. Um, I'm Steve D'Alessandro, talking to you here from uh, sunny Bathurst, uh, where the weather is chilly, but the welcome is always warm. Today we're going to talk about the changing world of marketing, uh, how marketing's evolved, and the importance of marketing, and what we mean by strategy. So let's start with what we mean by strategy, and that's really explained on this video. Since this is a strategy course, it seems only natural to start with a discussion of what strategy is and what it isn't. First, consider the following strategy statements drawn from actual documents and announcements from well-respected companies. Our strategy is to be the low-cost provider. We are pursuing a global strategy. The company's strategy is to integrate a set of regional acquisitions. Our strategy is to provide unrivaled customer service. Our strategic intent is to always be the first mover. Our strategy is to move from defense to industrial applications. What do these strategy statements all have in common? Well, first of all, none of them are actually strategies. They represent tactics, goals, objectives, and descriptions, but not strategies. They are mere strategic threads, small components of overall strategies. The problem is that in recent years, strategy has become something of a buzzword. Whenever we want to sound smart and demonstrate our business acumen, we just make sure the word strategy shows up in our ideas. The result is that we now refer to many mundane and uninteresting aspects of the business as being strategic, when they are really only small pieces of the overall business strategy. So then, what is a strategy? Being clear about what a strategy is will help us understand more clearly what a strategy is not. Well, the word strategy originally comes from the Greek word strategos, meaning the art of the general. In other words, the origin of strategy comes from the art of war, and specifically the role of the general in a war. In fact, there's a famous treatise entitled The Art of War, that is said to have been authored by Sun Tzu, a legendary Chinese general, around the 2nd century BC. Strategists considered the art of war to be one of the great masterpieces on strategy. In the art of war, the goal is to win. Winning is good and losing is very, very bad. Can you imagine the great Hannibal saying something like, our strategy is to beat Rome? No, Hannibal's goal was to defeat Rome. His strategy was to bring hidden strengths against the weaknesses of his enemy at the point of attack to achieve that goal, such as crossing the Alps when the enemies did not believe he could. The general is responsible for multiple units that must work together to win the battle and the war. The way the general adds value to the battle is by providing high-level orchestration and vision. That is, he can see what the field commanders cannot. Great generals think about the whole, and they work to coordinate all the necessary pieces, even sacrificing some pieces when necessary in order to ensure that the overall goal is achieved. We sometimes think of business as modern day war, but the casualties are more frequently investor pocketbooks rather than human lives. The challenge of the executive is similar to the challenge of the ancient general. The modern day executive needs to develop a set of complex tactics and activities that lead to a victory. So, how do we know what our strategy is? Or, if we do not have a strategy, how do we formulate one? A good strategy provides clear and concise answers to four key questions. First, where do we compete? In other words, what competitive arenas or markets will we be active in? We define markets as industries, product markets within those industries, and geographic markets. Second, what unique value do we bring to win in those markets? In other words, why do our customers choose our products and services when they could have chosen the products and services of any competitor out there? 
unique value could be cost or differentiation, which includes image, customization, styling, reliability, etc. Third, what resources and capabilities do we utilize to deliver that value? Do we have exceptional human capital, superior technology, unrivaled network connections, or a unique reputation? Resources generally refer to the things we have in our toolbox. These things can be tangible, such as a diamond mine or an oil field, or they can be intangible, such as a reputation. Capabilities generally refer to the things that we can do, or our ability to use the things in our toolbox. Fourth, how do we sustain our ability to provide that unique value? Are there barriers to imitation? Are there factors that keep our competitors from being willing or able to replicate the value we create for our customers? This last question focuses on understanding what factors allow us to continue to win over time. So one example of a clearly defined strategy comes from IKEA. IKEA sells relatively inexpensive, contemporary Scandinavian style furniture and home furnishings to primarily young white collar customers all over the world. By being the first furniture retailer to put stores in every major country, IKEA has greater scale than local competitors. Okay, so, um, oops, I'll just come back here. So you can see that there is a bit more in that video for you to see, but basically you can see the ideas of what we talk about, strategy, strategy is not a goal. Um, often uh, the four um, aspects there that are talked about, how do we compete? What unique value do we bring? What resources do we utilize? And how do we sustain values in a nutshell defined strategy? It sounds simple, but often it's a very complex process to get to a really simple strategy that's effective. So what are some of the learning outcomes that we'll, we'll, uh, I'll talk about today? I'm sorry about, uh, I'm just moving myself out of the way here. Okay, so the first is, uh, we'll talk about the development of marketing over the last few years, and this really feeds into the development of how strategy is changing and also the forces driving these changes as well. We'll talk about why we plan in marketing. You've got some idea as well, but there is some, I suppose, evidence out there and aspects of why planning is beneficial to do. Even though planning is imperfect, not planning is a really bad way to go. What makes good marketing planning? Uh, what uh, some of the factors there that have been shown to be successful in business? What do you look for? What will I look for? Hopefully when you come up with some of your assignments later on in this course. So we can first start with the evolution of marketing thought of practice from the 1950s. And the underlying theory of marketing um, comes from Adam Smith and uh, the idea of industrialization and specialization. So the idea of uh, specializing focus, uh, being more effective and uh, being able to produce economies of scale and being able to meet customer needs. So the first sort of recorded mention of meeting customer needs dates all the way back to a guy called Tosdall in, in from Harvard Business Review in 1933 in the middle of the depression where marketing became more important and he's basically said superficially at least the idea that customer needs should be the starting point for business thinking is certainly not revolutionary. So he's saying in that 1933 that marketing was important. The early practices of marketing were pearl and ivory soap from the US and UK respectively. Other examples are the old um, cornflakes from the turn of the century, the brown box uh, Kodak camera from the turn of the century as well, the invention of photography. Uh, the important aspects here was the idea of packaging uniformly and the promotion of brands. We start to see ad agencies developing from about the 1840s onwards in the UK and the USA. And even early database marketing, uh, marketing through which we now see as internet marketing, started in Germany uh, using bibliographical databases of the population in the 1870s. Then marketing, of course, evolved in the 1950s through to the 1980s. One of the most famous um, articles was written by Theodore Levitt called Marketing Myopia or Short-Sightedness in Harvard Business Review in 1960. And what Levitt talks about is this idea of moving away from a product and the functions it provides rather than the benefits of why it's being used. And also that companies need to, cannot just rely on success, that eventually markets will change and he calls this creative destruction 
that mark that companies will eventually need to develop products or services which will supersede what they're already doing because because if they don't do it somebody else will sorry wrong way McCarthy um, in the 19 in his book in 1960 marketing management surprise surprise uh, talked about uh, the marketing manager being a mixer of various ingredients and that's where we get the marketing mix that's why it's called a mix um, the, the four P's that you're probably familiar with Kotler's 1967 text which is uh, so he's still around today um, also expanded the idea of marketing more to organizations and to strategies Keith who is the mark executive uh, president of consumer products at Pillsbury wrote a, a very important article called The Marketing Revolution for the Journal of Marketing 1960s where he talks about moving away from products to the selling concept through the marketing orientation that we're familiar with today. Procter & Gamble, uh, who um, a, are a, a fast-moving consumer goods, set up the brand uh, marketing strategy that we're familiar with today and we get sort of this idea of managing not just one product but a whole suite of brands for different markets from that, com from that company. Then we have some further changes which occurred from the 1980s through to the 2000s, which is the idea that marketing wasn't something just that marketers did, but it was an organisational process. And so we start to get things like the importance of customer service across the organisation, that related to that, the measurement of customer satisfaction management, we got start to get this idea of relationship marketing management, uh, relationship management as well, customer relationship management and databases, the importance of brands, the idea of customer lifetime value, so which is sort of a, a financial point of view, and the accountability or impact of marketing in terms of financial value to the firm. I'm just going to get myself out of the way here. Some organisational wide concepts and practices that we've seen, which have really come from marketing, is this idea of total quality management, uh, just-in-time infantries to reduce infantry costs, strategic alliances and networks, uh, organisational culture and change, this idea of trying to get people on side with a the strategy. Then we move into strategic planning, management concept of, of what we call competitive advantage, which was, uh, I guess, highlighted in the previous video, and the concept of a value chain. Moving into what we now call, look at corporate social responsibility, the idea of being uh, concerned about long-term impacts of marketing actions as well. And then finally, the idea of stakeholder theory where marketing organisations serve a number of parties, governments, um, the public, uh, as well as consumers. So, for example, banks are not only responsible, have to act responsibly shareholders, they've got to consider government and wider society. The area we're in now is often called the digital area, and I'm just going to move myself over here. And uh, here we're talking about from a web information source through to a web as a participatory pro program, Web 2.0 and social media. Um, here, this has really been a catalyst, what we call for disruptive innovations. The innovations can come from consumers or from various groups and stakeholder groups, and a shift to rather than just satisfying customers, but one of what we call engagement. Um, the idea that consumers are looking for, I guess, meaningful and authentic um, people to engage with in, in terms of social media. And of course, the feedback loop through social media now is much faster than it used to be. Uh, touch points, the customer journey. So the number of uh, touch points now are, are, are greater than they used to be because of the internet, online, social media, mobile, telephony, and so on. And really a shift of how we might um, communicate and how we do transactions and how we do spend most of our lives from desktops to mobile devices through to now cloud storage. And so these are some very important fundamental changes that are occurring in marketing practice, hence in marketing strategy. And we can see this reflected by what we call marketing just in the last eight years. So um, I just move myself out uh, over here a bit. Okay. So we're seeing the transformation just uh, between these in these three years, rather, and in two thousand and four, uh, and a definition which stood for a long time in marketing is is mentioned here, um, and that it was a process of communicating, delivering value for managing customer relationships, organisations, stakeholders.
three years later, until present, it's changed to um, creating and exchanging offerings. So away from value that have value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. So it's a much broader definition. Many business strategies now take into account this approach. So why bother planning? Why is planning important? Well, um, the accomplishments or benefits of planning can be summarized as following. Firstly, it leads to a better position or standing or reputation of the organization. So the idea that the organization gets known for something. And so people are not making a decision purely based on price. It helps the organization progress in the way management considers most suitable. So it's a way of focusing efforts in the organization. Uh, it really does help in management decision making if you know which way you're going. And so it really helps to combine and use resources and capabilities effectively. Because it's respond we're responding to the environment and changes in markets, industries, uh, government policy, societal changes, it helps keep organisations flexible rather than merely relying on what's worked in the past. Some other accomplishments and plannings can be summarised here as well. Uh, it really does, if it's done well, and it's not always done well, uh, it really does help um, provide people with a sense of purpose and uh, provides an enthusiastic approach to help solve greater organisational problems. For example, uh, delays in meeting customer orders, um, delays in customer service, credit issues and so on. Um, it really helps um, provide a check on overall progress and planned objectives, so strategy is a useful way. Uh, for an organisation to look at where it wants to go into the future. Um, if it's done well, and we have a fairly wide definition, so you've got many banks now adopting a more uh, socially responsible aspect with regards to climate change, it help, can help uh, to uh, socially and economically useful results. Not always, but it hopefully can. The next point really just... Uh, really uh, talks about meeting, I suppose, future directions in the marketplace and industries around us and how uh, marketing can be quite useful in that area. Now, that's all me talking. What does the research show? Well, here's some research from Harvard Business Review of 10,000 companies, that's a reasonable sample, across 92 companies. And they've really classified these companies into two groups, underperforming companies, um, above competitors in three years and overperforming companies. So this should, sorry, this should be the other way. This should be underperforming. So these are below the competitors and these are above. Okay. And what you can see here is that these are the characteristics that were found to be different. So our overperforming companies were more likely to use data to distinguish their leading brands. They were more likely to have position based brand positions. They, these, Approaches weren't just brands they connected to a corporate strategy. They had process twists and incentives to inspire employees to get results. They focused on the right measurements. Often organisations might say, oh, we're all about profits, but what drives profits? Is it turnover? Is it um, churn? That is, you know, how quickly you have to gain customers. Is it satisfaction? Um, the mark, um, net promoter score and so on. But having the right metrics so, for example, one of the most important metrics in uh, many service organisations, the Met Promoter Score, repeat business, the fact that people come back, not necessarily sales. And capabilities, well, they're more likely to have built the correct capabilities. So you can see here that the evidence is out there that strategy is important and doing certain things in strategies makes you more successful than other organisations. According to the Boston Consultancy Group, who are a large multinational consultancy company who deal with not-for-profits, profit organisations, the following questions should be addressed or asked when you're doing strategy and planning. Firstly, who should be involved in planning and to what extent? Um, often planning is done by a small group of top-level management and really you do need to include functional managers and then you obviously need to include our business managers further down. What part should be accomplishment through joint effort? 
how effective collaboration can be achieved amongst the participants. So the BCG approach isn't just saying what you do, it's saying how you do it. And, and how you do it or how you implement is as important, or you might even argue more important than what you do. How can planning be made appropriately emphasised and rewarded? So one of the aspects is this command control idea of, of management. Do, do it because I said you should do it, rather than thinking about it might go back to recruitment, it might go back to reward systems, it might go back to assigning responsibility. How, to, how you coordinate staffing for planning, who's responsible for what, is often a very important um, process. Now, it's a bit easier in a small business, there aren't too many people to coordinate, but a large organisation or a, such as um, Virgin or even IKEA, this becomes more of an issue. How should the planning unit be used in the organisation? So you might have a series of sub-plans. Um, so Virgin, of course, as you know, they're in credit cards, uh, they're in uh, air, air, air travel, uh, they're in uh, colas. So each of these areas operate in different markets with different products, and there might be different strategies, but there should be an overall consistent corporate strategy. Okay, and We'll talk about that in the next lecture. What is the role of the chief executive in, in planning? Often, um, this is, a, I suppose, an almost an inspirational explaining role after the strategy's been um, put together. Now, you might be very successful, but you may not be ethical. And retail giants such as Woolworths and Coles, um, while they've been effect effective in providing business strategy, um, it's questionable regarding some of their ethical practices. Some of the main strategies that these organisations have, have organised have, have used are things like loyalty schemes, restricting distribution outlets, so not allowing competitors, tied up leases and so on, and lower prices. However, both of these have been accused of lowering prices for farmers and other providers to unsustainable levels and what we call predatory or uh, anti-competitive pricing. This is addressed in the next video, which talks about how much power can large businesses have and is this really necessarily a good thing. This is Woolworths Limited, and this is West Farmers. You know them as Woolies and Coles, the big friendly giants, the number one and two retailers in Australia. 23 cents of every dollar we spend ends up in their pockets. More than just Woolies and Coles, they own a range of supermarkets. They also own variety stores, electronics outlets, and hardware chains, as well as many of the places you buy alcohol. And not just Bolo's, Woolies has a 75% stake in 270 pubs and clubs, and Coles is catching up with 91. That's a lot of poker machines. Woolies alone operate 12,000 of them. The Giants also sell fuel through deals with Caltex and Shell, and West Farmers owns coal mines in three states. But their core business is still groceries. Together, they share more than 70% of the Australian market. The UK's two biggest chains share 48%. The US equivalents are mere 20. The Giants flex their competitive muscles in a number of ways. They gradually buy out smaller rivals in a process called creeping acquisitions. They also buy land their competitors might be interested in and leave it vacant, a tactic known as Greenfield Acquisitions. In 2008, an ACCC inquiry found evidence of more than 700 restrictive covenants. Deals made by Woolies and Coles with shopping malls to keep out rivals such as Aldi and IGA. The Giants agreed to phase out this anti-competitive practice, but hundreds of the contracts remain. The Giants have also been accused of predatory pricing, using their huge buying power to push prices down driving smaller competitors out of business, at which point they're free to raise prices again. And they don't just squeeze their rivals, they squeeze their suppliers too. The National Farmers Federation claims farmers are getting as little as 5% of what you pay at the checkout. Finance commentator Robert Gottliebson describes this as one of the greatest scandals ever seen in this country. Despite a recent ACCC inquiry into pricing competition backing the giants, farmers groups are now calling for a royal commission. Last year, Woolies and West Farmers made over $100 billion in revenue. They spend millions of that marketing themselves as caring Australians. Yet our grocery prices are up 41% since 2000, 
that's 8% higher than the OECD average. But if you want to protest by shopping elsewhere, good luck. Woolies and Coles have 6,500 stores. Despite protests in some communities, that number keeps growing. Woolies and Coles, our big friendly giants. As the Coles ads tell us, every dollar counts. Okay, so um, really see, so firms must also try and add, I suppose, ethically if they can. Um, I think they should really uh, for long-term competitive advantage because as we've seen with the banks recently, if they don't, the government will eventually intervene. Let's hope that there's some sort of sanity prevailing in this area. Now, if the strategic process which we'll um, talk about in in this, uh, I suppose, this is the structure of the course. We'll be talking about how uh, this occurs from setting a mission, organisational mission or reason to exist, our business definition of scope, which markets we want to compete in, which industries we want to compete in. And then we go through the planning process down here, which is strategic analysis, uh, developing the strategy, implementation and then ensuring that the strategy is controlled and effectively measured which feeds back into each of these stages. It looks simple but often this is quite a complex process. Thank you very much for your time and I hope you enjoyed um, the first lecture with me. Cheers.